All right, here we're here gonna we're gonna work out through a few of these problems tonight. Got the focus set. So these are some problems out of your student text, pages 33 and 34. It's not a homework assignment. You don't have to turn them in. But I want you to work through them for practice, and then, I, I, of course, you, you need to know whether you've got them right or not. So it turns out i got to work through some problems. All right. Um, there's no real good way to do this, so I am going to do it by hand and hope that you can see everything that I'm doing. All right, so to solve this first one, we have, what, it, what, it's, what is it asking for? Potential energy gained in foot-pounds force first. Okay, so we know we're going to be solving a potential energy problem, and potential energy is equal to mass times gravitational force, force of acceleration, times height. All right, so what do we have for mass? We have 240 pounds mass. Now that is how much matter it makes up that person. That person has 240 pounds mass of matter. That doesn't tell us how much they weigh. And that's what confuses people about the pounds mass, pounds force, and G sub C. Is we hear somebody says, hey, how much do you weigh? And you say, I weigh, I weigh 240 pounds. And, but what we're really saying is 240 pounds force, right? Because weight is a force. If I weighed myself on the moon, I would weigh less. In fact, I might be down to 240 pounds. We'll see. But the, I would still have the same mass. So whatever mass I have right now, or whatever mass this person has, 240 pounds, if they went to the moon, they'd still have 240 pounds mass. But when you apply the gravi the force due to uh, the force of acceleration due to gravity, they would weigh less on the moon than here. Now, fortunately, the way our arbitrary-ish units were created, we have uh, one pound force is one pound mass here on Earth. But in order to make the units all work and cancel, you should still use that G sub C to show that one pound force equals one pound mass. Anyway, that was a little sidebar. So we have 240 pounds mass. And G, we know, is 32.2 feet per second squared. And the Z... So we start off at 441 feet, and we're going up to 606 feet. That is an elevation change of 165 feet. Okay? So 165 feet. So what am I missing here? Oh, our conversion. So in order to convert the pound's mass... How much matter the guy has to how much he weighs, we have to divide, we have to convert the pounds mass with 32.2 foot pounds mass per pound force second squared. Now let's check our units. Pounds mass cancel out, second squared cancel out, foot and this foot cancels out, 32.2 cancels out. I am left with foot pounds force, and I'm left with 240 times 165. So 240 times 165 39,600. And that's foot pounds force. So that's how much potential energy... Make sure I answered the question. Always go back and reread the question. How much potential energy did they gain in foot pounds force? Well, they went from 441 feet to 606 feet, which is a dis change. I should check that number too. 
Never do math in your head. Always check. 165. So that is a change in elevation of 165 feet. And so that's the potential energy change. All right. Now to convert that to um, BTUs and joules, we'll go to our handy dandy steam tables book here. Uh, and there's some convenient conversions. In fact, well, page 97, we want to go from foot pounds force to BTUs. So every foot pound, every 778 foot pounds force is a BTU. Every 778 foot pounds force. So divided by 778 foot pounds force equals one BTU. Oops, is one BTU. So 39,600. Divided by 778.16, I should, don't leave those off, 50.89 BTUs. All right, well, that's the first problem, let's see. And then I'll let you use that same idea and check your joules, all right? You can go from BTUs to joules. Or you can go use your foot-pounds force to joules. That might be easier. Yeah, all right. Get that out of the way, and let's move on to problem two. Oh, the second part of this. If they make the trip in two minutes, what was power and horsepower? Okay, so force is a mass times acceleration or distance, but either way we end up with a force, and energy is a force times a distance, right? Some force applied over uh, some amount of time. Well, work equals energy over time, and then horsepower is work. So we need to know what, en what the energy is over the unit time. Well, we have um, 39,600 foot-pounds force, right, over two minutes. And that's foot-pounds force per minute. Well, what's our conversion for horsepower here? There's 33,000 foot-pounds force per minute. And that's one horsepower. One horsepower is 33,000 foot-pounds force per minute. So Foot-pounds force, I have horsepower, and it is 39,000 divided by 2 times 33,000. So it looks like uh, 0 0.59 horsepower. Not bad. All right. Let's move on to problem two. Problem two says, what is the kinetic energy of a 3,000 pound mass, and it doesn't say mass, but pound, pound mass car moving at 55 miles per hour? There's a little trick to solving this to make it easier, and that's con always convert miles per hour to feet per second. I mean, we're talking about kinetic energy, um, feet per second just makes it a lot easier to work with. So, kinetic energy is equal to uh, one half mass velocity squared or mass velocity squared over two g sub c. The exact same thing. 
right? Because we're dealing with pounds mass, and any time we're dealing with pounds mass, we have to convert, but we're, but we're trying to get energy. If we're trying to get energy out of pounds mass, out of a, the amount of mass, we have to convert that mass to a weight, because a weight is a force, and you need a force to get the amount of energy. All right. Um, let's do this. Let's see. So kinetic energy. I have 3,000 pound mass car. And it is moving. And that's the mass. Uh, I'll do the two down here. The velocity squared. 55 miles per hour and I want to convert the 55 miles per hour so actually I'm going to convert that over here 55 miles per hour and one mile is 5,280 feet and one hour is Oops. 3,600 seconds, miles per hour. So, my hour cancels out, my miles cancel out, 55 times 5,280, divided by 3600. So that's 80.6, that's 80.66 feet per second. So let's do feet per second in this. It makes it so much easier. So 80.66 squared feet squared per second squared because we have to square all those because it's velocity squared. All right, now I've got the G sub C, 32.2 feet, foot, uh, pounds mass per pound force second squared. All right, let's check our units here. Pound mass goes away. Second squared goes away. Uh, foot cancels one of the feet here. There's two of them, so that's I'm left with one foot. And that's foot pounds force, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Kinetic energy, foot pounds force. So 3,000 times 80.66 squared divided by 64.4. Alright, so 3,000 well, let's do the squared thing. Let's see if I can figure this calculator out. So we got 80.66 squared times 3,000 divided by 2 times 32.2, which is 64.4. So we're left with 303,076 foot-pounds force. Yep. Okay, yep. Looks that all looks correct. Um, that's what that one's asking, right? Three thousand pound car moving at fifty-five miles per hour. Kinetic energy. There you go. So the next one. I apologize in advance. I'm probably not going to edit this video a lot. It's probably just going to let it run. So this is going to be a long, boring one, like some of those others I see on YouTube. 
but that's what it is. All right, convert megawatts to BTUs per hour. Let's just see what our handy dandy charts here have. Do we have a megawatts to BTUs per hour? We should have a watts to BTUs, or a BTUs per hour. BTUs to kilowatt hours. I could do, there it is. One watt is equal to three, whoops. One watt is equal to 3.41214 BTUs per hour. All right, and it's asking for 3,486 megawatts. Now a megawatt is a million watts. So 3486 times 10 to the 6, 3 billion 486 million watts. Man, that's a lot. Where did it go? Watts. Two and every and one watt, one watt is equal to 3.41214 BTUs per hour. So we just multiply the 3 billion 486. times 3.41214. So that is 11,894,700. Wow, that's a big number. 11 billion BTUs per hour. All right. Hey Google, convert 3,486 megawatts to BTUs per hour. Sorry, I don't have any information about that. Ah, oh, stupid Google. I just wanted to check. All right, doesn't matter. All right, what do we got here next? Gallon of a fluid. Ooh, fun ones. So one gallon weighs 6.7 pounds mass. But we know we're going to be solving for density, so the other way to write this is 6.7 pounds mass per gallon. Okay. And... Gallons per cubic feet. Let's see. One gallon is 0.13368 cubic feet. So my gallons cancel and I'm left with pounds mass per cubic feet. That means the density is 6.7 divided by 0.13368 which is 50.11 or 50.12 pounds mass per cubic feet. So what that tells me since normal room temperature water is around 62.4 pounds mass per cubic foot. This is really low density water, which means it's really, really warm. And you can look this value up in your steam tables, say 50.12 pounds mass per cubic foot, and from this density, you can actually look at the temperature. So this is a sneak peek into next week. Let's see if that's a value in here.
So, but density is not in your steam tables. So we have to use your specific volume, which is 1 divided by the density. 1 divided by 50.12. It's an inverse. So the specific volume, 0 0.01995. That's what we're looking for. And that's this V up here. Zero, one, nine. So I'm on saturated steam pressure, table two, point zero, one, nine, nine, five, two. There's a four eight. That's the closest one right there. Oops. And I'm in the, looking at the V sub F. So this is the closest specific volume. So I, that tells me that the temperature of that, uh, the water steam mixture in that problem is 476 degrees Fahrenheit and at a pressure of 550 PSI A, absolute. Anyway, that's for next week. But we did solve the density. Oh, and we solved specific volume. <laughs> Some of these questions really should wait till next week. Uh, specific weight we're not even going to mess with. All right, 514 Fahrenheit to Celsius at Rankine. So the Celsius, or let's do the Rankine first, because Fahrenheit, right? Fahrenheit and Rankine go together. Celsius and Kelvin go together. So Fahrenheit, 514 plus 460, uh, 974 degrees Rankine. Now Celsius, it's 514 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. Um, times 5 divided by 9. Not doing that one in my head. 514 minus 32 equals times 5 equals divided by 9 equals 267.77 blah 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 degrees Celsius. All right. And I wrote on that paper instead of this paper. Oh well, doesn't matter. All right, let's go to the next one. Pneumatic cylinder for a valve. So diameter is six inches. What force is exerted on the piston? Force. All right, let's always start with what, what equation are we using? Uh, force, force, force. So force equals, in this case, pressure times area. Well, we know the pressure and we can figure out the area. Pressure is equal to uh, 30 PSIG. Now that PSIG tells us, you know, that it's not taking into, um, taking the atmosphere into account. And anytime you're solving force problems, you want to convert to PSIA. So we add plus 14.7, PSI, and that tells us the 44.7 PSIA. So that's the pressure in the piston, or the, that's the air pressure in the piston. Okay, absolute pressure. So diameter, uh, area equals pi r squared. So pi times 3 squared, so pi times 9. So force, so what we're looking for, equals 44.7 PSIA. Oops, we'll do the pounds force per inches squared. And times pi times 9. That seems too easy. Am I missing something here? 
44.7 times should be like would like 12 1200 something 44.7 times 3.14 we'll go simple on pi times 9 1263 oh that's what we're missing no we're not missing equals 1263 pounds force there, there it is. I knew I was missing something. Nine, which is the area, inches squared. There we go. Pounds force, 1,263 pounds force. This is why you always write out the units in the ladder problem. Because when it's quarter to 11 at night and you're tired and fireworks are going off. Yeah. All right. What number was that? We answer the question, pneumatic cylinder, diameter 6 inches, what force if the air pressure is 30 pounds gauge? Alright, oh this is an easy one. So, condenser is at 27 inches mercury vacuum. So I'm going to draw my relative zero, right, atmospheric. And I'm going to draw absolute zero. And it's 27 inches of mercury vacuum, which means from the relative zero. So it's 27 inches of mercury down from my relative zero. Which means, another way of saying that, is knowing that my, uh, that my a perfect vacuum, uh, an absolute zero, is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury, then I know I'm only 2 point... Uh, 92, right? 29.92 minus 27. So I'm only 2.92 inches of mercury absolute away from my absolute zero. And it's asking for absolute pressure. So I convert my relative inches of mercury vacuum to an absolute pressure first. Now I can convert 2.92 inches of mercury to um, an at PSIA. And let's go to our conversion chart. And the pressure section. So points. 0.49116 PSIA per inches mercury. 0.49116 PSIA per inch mercury. So then I can multiply. Once you turn your calculator, your stupid thing sideways it just keeps wanting to go do that 2.92 times 0.49116 units cancel 1.43 pounds per square inch absolute batteries dying this is another easy one so 1,020 pounds per square inch gauge, which if you just draw this out, um, right? So this is atmospheric pressure, and this is saying 1,020 pounds above atmospheric pressure, and that's PSIG. But we want to know the absolute pressure, so we add the 14.7 pounds to the 1020. So plus 14.7 and that gives us uh, 1039.7 PSIA. So hopefully those pressure ones are easy. All right, let's do a bottom of the pool problem. 
All right, let's see. <coughs> so pressure equals density times force of gravity times height. Uh, let's see, we know we're going to assume density. Now if this told us, hey, it's a cold swimming pool or it's a heated swimming pool, we'll be able to use our steam tables and figure out a density. Right now we're going with the generic 62.4. Um, pounds mass per cubic foot, the force of gravity 32.2 feet per second squared, and the height 12 um, feet. Okay, so what am I missing? Well, we got pounds mass, so we have to convert the pounds mass to a pounds force, 32.2. Uh, foot pounds mass per pound force second squared. Alright, let's check our units and see if I'm missing anything else. Second squared, pounds mass, foot, and that leaves a foot up here and three feet down here. So this one's going to take out two, or sorry, one of those, leaving two. So I am forgetting something. Right now our units end up as pounds force per square foot. And we want cubic inches. So one square foot is equal to 144 inches squared. So the feet cancel and I have pounds force per inch squared. Alright. Yep, all that adds up. Well, I can also cancel 32.2. So 62.4 times 12 divided by 144. 62.4 times 12 divided by 144. So pressure is 5.2 PSI G. And this is, you have to realize that this is calculating the pressure due to the height of the column of fluid. So it's pressure gauge. Uh, the absolute pressure at the bottom of the pool is plus 14.7. And that would be 19.9 pounds per square inch absolute. All right, my battery's dying and these other problems are more for next week. Okay, actually, let me change out the battery. I'll be back. All right. Let's see what we got here. So, I can't see nothing. All right. New paper. Oh, a lot of words. Let's see. Level indication. A vented DP cell. Okay. Tap the bottom of the tank. Water is added or removed. So let's draw a tank with a vented DP cell. I'm not sure you guys have had that. Um, don't be alarmed. Don't be too alarmed. Yeah, doesn't matter. All right. Well, I'll just, this is me showing you what it looks like and how to do it. So a DP cell, simply there's lots of different types of DP cells, uh, differential pressure, and all it does is have a separation between one side and the other. There's bellows type, board on tube types, all different types of differential diaphragm types differential pressure cells and it's just measuring from a, a variable leg which is the side that can move right this is the level and the level changes this is the variable side and a reference leg so this is the reference and then the difference across here tells you hey is level going up or level going down because as level goes up this variable leg pressure changes the reference leg pressure should stay the same 
and so that DP and you'd have a little meter here that based on the differential pressure across that DP cell, that differential pressure cell. Um, so what tells us this is the high pressure side, low pressure side, uh, what tells us that this, that level's low? Well, if level's low, then the only pressure on this side is the same as the pressure on this side. So the differential pressure, as it gets closer to zero, that means level is low. Now, if level goes up, right, you've got a denser medium here, and so the pressure on this side goes up because you have the pressure up here in the gas space plus pressure due to the height of the column of liquid. And so as this pressure goes up, further away from the low pressure side, then level, it shows the DP goes up, level goes up. All right. So what it's asking, what it's asking for, though, has nothing to do with that. Um, I'm just, that's me just babbling through while I think about the problem here. So I've got a water level in here. And it's saying that whatever temperature it is, the temperature goes up by 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Well, if I, I know that if the temperature goes up, the actual level in here, because water expands when it heats up, the actual level, and there's two questions here, actual and indicated. Actual level goes up. But... The indicated does not, right? Because remember what the pressure sensed here is. Pressure is equal to the density times gravity times the height. And though the height goes up, the density is going down. And your pressure and the density is going down by as much as the height's going up. Those two are directly proportional. And so your Though actual level goes up, indicated level stays the same. Yeah, hope that made sense. All right. Let's see. It's another dry reference leg detector. Okay. Got a water level. The gas space has been inadvertently left isolated. So let's draw our little isolation valves. And just the gas space, so that's the top. So this is closed off. So whatever was locked in here on this low pressure side is still there. No matter what happens to the level in here. So what will happen to indicated tank level if the pressure is raised? Okay. Well, if pressure is raised, just like we talked about up here, if the pressure goes up, that's the same as level going up. Right? If it sees the higher pressure it sees on the high pressure side, the more pressure it sees on the high pressure side, uh, the higher the indicated level. So indicated level goes up. That's it. Huh, that's an easy one. All right. Um, this is a steam, this is next week, steam next week, 10 pound mass steam, 100 PSI, BTUs raised to, this is, all right, those are next week. I'm going to get this uploaded for you. I apologize, it was a lengthy, um, mess, but that's where we're at. All right. Thank you. I hope you're having a good night and uh, have a good fourth tomorrow. All right.